In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Are you guys ready? Let's go. If you got your Bibles, but 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 bust them out. We're going to Genesis chapter two. Looking at the. That's right. I said Genesis chapter two. Two. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I told you this day would come. Um, if you're new here, um, we're going through the book of Genesis. And it's the, actually the, the the first book in your Bible, um, and uh, we're going through it chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And honestly, we've actually been going through it word by word. So we've been in this thing for over three months, actually close close to four months now, and um, we've been in the first chapter this entire time. So you'll have to bear with us. This is kind of a a happy day for us uh, as we get to graduate on to the second chapter of, uh, of Genesis. This is a big, this is a big deal. Uh, not only that, but today we're going to be studying the seventh day of creation, which means that next Sunday we're starting the second epoch, um, uh, the second um, uh, uh, period of time captured in the book of Genesis. And so um, you say, well, why are you doing that? You know, well, we, we at Sierra Bible Center, we love the Bible, and we don't just ascribe to the Bible as a piece of literature, but we believe that the Bible is God's inspired word. We believe that it's alive and that it's active, and we take it literal. So for us, it's not just fiction, but we take it as literal, and we actually apply the Bible to our lives. Some people believe that the Bible is a good book, that it is a holy book, and that it could be put on your library of, of, of books, and it could live alongside of other holy books. Um, we believe, again, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It is alive, it is active, it is sharper than a two-edged sword. And here's the truth about God's word. That when you get it into you, meaning that you just read it, you read it with an open heart and with an open mind. Um, I also think it's a good idea just to ask Holy Spirit just to come, um, just by faith, before you begin reading the Word. But as you just begin to read the Bible, um, what you can do is you can read it, memorize it if you want, but you could also just forget it and shut it. Skip a beat when you're not even realizing it, when you're just living your life, minding your own business, Holy Spirit will actually bring back to mind things that you read in the Bible that you thought that you forgot about. Why? Because it didn't just go into your mind. It went into your spirit. And for this reason, the Bible is so, so, so important. And as parents, we believe that it is our role to teach our kids how to read the Word of God, how to apply the Word of God, how it is to be used, and most importantly, how it is not to be used. Now, I said the Bible is a two-edged sword. I did not say it's a baseball bat. So if you've ever, if you've ever had somebody bash you with a Bible, it's because... It's because they've, they've never been taught that is with much skill and maturity that you wield this sharp gift from God. It's also a blessing to have my Verizon guy here uh, from Verizon Wireless in Issaquah. Good to see you, buddy. If you guys want to switch over to Verizon, go and see him. We met this last week. He, he, he did me right. He did me right. So it's good to be with the Verizon family. All right. Here we go. In the book of Genesis, it begins, and I'm going to uh, use some various Hebrew words. If you're Hebrew, I apologize. Um, uh, I, 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 I do my best. The book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, says about a sheet, which is not a point in time. It's actually a period of time. So in the beginning, in the first 
epoch of time, in time, okay, God created the heavens and the earth. That's right. We believe that all things exist because of our great God. And because we believe that, we believe that he has embedded his great thumbprint into everything that he has created. And so, Bereshit, in the first epoch of time, before there was anything, there was Elohim. Elohim means mighty God, the one worthy to be worshipped. Elohim is also a word um, uh, uh, communicating the plurality of the Godhead. That is, that God exists, a Father, a Son, and a Spirit. So, Barashit Elohim bara, which is the word to create, to fashion, and to mold. He created the heavens and the earth. Okay, Moses, Moses, the author of Genesis, how did he do it? Well, it says that his spirit, the spirit of God, the breath of God, the very presence of God, the ruach. Listen, if you're on the front row, it's going to be like SeaWorld today. I'm just going to shamu all over you. <laughs> you're going to wish you wore your mask today, okay? It's, uh, better sheet. Elohim, Barak, okay? How? The Spirit of God, the Ruach, okay? Hovered in the midst of the Tohu Vavohu, okay? This is the word in the chaos, okay? Um, in the chaos waters, in the darkness. And so for most Christians, they wrestle with this a little bit. Why? Because they believe that chaos means that there is the absence of the presence of God. How many of you have ever felt very chaotic, very anxious? How many of you have ever felt like, I don't like this and I don't want to be here? That does not mean that God is not present. Yep, that biblically, that chaos is just an opportunity for creation. So the church needs to, to, to learn to stop running from chaos, but to start running into it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here's the other thing. Look at the person next to you say, mm-hmm. Here, here's the other thing. Is that we've also been taught that darkness is the absence of light. But what about John, where we read that a light shines in the darkness, but the darkness is incapable of overcoming it? You see, we've been taught that if we're surrounded by darkness, that we must, be, we must have done something wrong. But the truth is that, that when the light shows up, it doesn't mean that the darkness ceases to exist, which means that we need to learn how to be a light. That means contrasting to the frequency and the chaos of this world, and that we need to learn to be able to shine where? In the midst of the darkness. Yeah, but I don't want to. I want to be a light in the light. Then move to Texas. Here we go. Um, we have... Um, Genesis chapter 2. <laughs> Good times. So, <laughs> um, okay, all right, get together. Day one. On the first day, God, God created. How did God create? He created by speaking. What did God create on the first day? He said, let there be light and there was light okay and he separated the light from the darkness and the darkness he called night and the day he called day okay and um uh, so that's day one which is the creation of the first realm which is the realm of time on day two god came in and established the hebrew word rakia which means a dome okay and this is where god actually goes into the time that he creates and carves out space. On day one, God establishes the realm of time. On day two, he creates the realm of space. And how does that translate? Goes into time and he separates, okay, the sky above with the waters below. On day three, we see that God comes into the waters and he separates the waters from dry land. And we see, as I would call as a child, Mountain Rainier emerge and stretch into the sky. Oh, it's such a sweet mountain. No, it's a ticked off raging volcano just waiting to one day blow its top. 
<laughs> Just kidding. Um, so you've got Mount Rainier, and then you've got these valleys, and you've got dry land, and then what does God do? God clothes the dry land. He clothes the earth with vegetation. On day four, God comes, and he steps back into the dome, into the rakia, and he creates what would be called the lights. Now, he doesn't name them the sun, the moon, and the stars, okay? Uh, the pagans would do that several generations later. It's just referred to as the lights. Everyone say lights. We see on day five the establishment, the creation of the fish of the sea, and then it actually reads that from the sea comes forth the birds, and the birds come forth the sea, and we see the creation fill the skies and the seas below. On the sixth day of creation, six being every Christian's favorite number, good times, on day six, God creates all of the earth-dwelling creatures, okay, um, as well as um, uh, his image bearers, okay? That would be, uh, he said, let us create mankind, that word not gender-specific, speaking of man and woman, in our own image and likeness. Here he creates representatives, little photographs, a glimpse of who he is. Is. Isn't that amazing? There's a, a, a few hundred people um, in this room today. We're all radically different from each other. We talk different. We speak different. We drive different. Okay? Yep. And yet all of us are a unique representation of who our incredible Heavenly Father is. Isn't that amazing? Which brings us to the seventh day. Now, the seventh day is interesting, okay? It's, it's the day of rest, and we're going to have to battle with um, uh, some concepts of rest because a lot of us, we read the, the six days of creation. Oh, man, that is so awesome. And then all of a sudden, we get to the seventh day, and it's just like God rested. And we get this idea, of course, of course. Um, we, we, we understand the need for rest living in Seattle. That doesn't mean that we understand rest living in Seattle. Someone say amen. amen. Yeah, in Seattle, where usually both a mommy and a daddy have to work full time in order to make enough of a living to own a house in this, in this region, okay? This is a, a region where people are crushing and grinding, and, and, and they've, got, they've got all kinds of side jobs, and all, what do they call side jobs? Side hustles. they got all kinds of side hustles, and they're doing this, and they're doing that, and, you know, and, and, and in Seattle, and in our generation, we, we know what it means to work, and work, and work, and work. And then you get to this concept of rest, and you think, well, of course, you know, rest is, is, is when you get, you know, a lazy boy in a Netflix a subscription, and you sit out, and you veg for a day. But let me ask you, um, how many of you do that? By the no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just me? <laughs> so, you know, when we define rest according to this Western American definition of rest, how many of you, you, you crush, you grind, you side hustle, you do all this stuff, and then you, um, you, you, you sit down and you watch an entire season of Lego Masters, uh, or two entire season of, you know, and, 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 you, do, and you just have, a, you do all this, but how many of you, when you watch tons of media and you do all this kind of thing, you don't necessarily feel rested? Okay. Um, now, the thing about it is, is that did you know on average, the average American spends seven and a half hours a day on media? This is seven and a half hours a day, not, not working with your screen, but using screens as an opportunity to be entertained. Seven and a half hours a day finding entertainment on a screen. And yet, when you look at the statistics for the average American man and woman, you look at our health rates, you look at the, the stress factors, you look at um, uh, everything that's, that's, that's taking place, we know that within a true posture of rest, that true rest has a way of alleviating everything from health conditions to, to marriage problems to parenting uh, conditions. But the problem is, is that we have been given an incorrect um, definition for what rest is. And the reason for that is that within the American church, we've had an incorrect theology for what 
rest is. And so today we're actually going to dive into only three verses. These are profound verses. These are revelatory verses. And I really, really pray that, 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 that something will kind of shift inside of us because I think that today is going to position us for what God wants to do here at Seattle Revival Center and with God's people even next year. I believe that this year is a positioning year that God is saying, get your house ready. Why? Because I'm about to occupy the house in a profound way in 2023. Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Everyone say finish. What does that mean? It means that God finished what he started. Let me tell you something. God has started something in you and he's going to finish what he started. He's not going to leave you high and dry. He's not going to abandon you. He loves you. He's going to finish what he started. They were all finished, the host of them. And on the seventh day, everyone say seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and then he rested, okay? Um, For all the millennials, what does that mean? It means that he finished what he started, and then he rested. What are you doing? I'm just chillaxing, man. I'm just chillaxing. Okay, that's awesome, but that's what you did yesterday and the day before that. Right, like, you know, when are you going to get a job? Well, I'm just really in a season of rest. No, you're in a season of laziness. You need to finish. You need to finish what you started, then rest. Okay? All right, I, let's get back to this. God finished what he had started, and then he rested on the seventh day from what? From all of his work that he had done. Now it says here, on the seventh day. Now this word day in the Hebrew is the word Y-O-M, Yom. And it's not necessarily uh, speaking of uh, a 24-hour period of time. This word Yom for day can be translated an age, a season, or a period of time. And so the Hebraic mindset doesn't necessarily view Yom as a 24-hour period, but it points us to the Lord who steps into this seventh era or realm, and in this place, um, he rests. Now, I've always wrestled with this because of, of, of my understanding of the first six days of creation, and we read this, that God worked, 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 worked. He worked, worked, like the Swedish chef. He worked, 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 right? <laughs> and then he rested. And the question is, is like, did God really need to rest? Like, did God really actually need to get, to, to get out his, his lazy boy and, and, and turn on Netflix and actually like, like did, did God actually need this? The interesting thing here is that this is, he enters into the yom, into this era, into this age into this epoch into this atmosphere of what of shabbat sabbath that on the seventh day yes he works but on the seventh day he enters into the realm of sabbath and it's not being contained by a 24 hour time frame okay in this place of Sabbath, Shabbat, is the understanding of celebration. That when God entered into this place, it wasn't him just vegging out. That what God did is he created, and on the seventh day, he ceased from his labor, and he enjoyed, he celebrated, he had great gratitude of heart and what he was participating in. You guys, celebration has to be a core value within our lives. Why? Because it is the DNA of Shabbat that we celebrate, that we don't just endure life. We celebrate the reality that my heart is beating. We don't just endure our children, but we receive them with gratitude. And when you receive your child and you're no longer just enduring your child, which I know a thing or two about enduring a child, okay, but there is that place where you endure and then there is that place where you bring your child next to your heart and you give thanks and with gratitude in your heart, what are you doing? You are Shabbating. You are participating with what Father felt on the seventh day when he sat down and said, Ah, it's perfect. So,
So we see he enters into this place. On the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, always ends with a pattern. You'll find these patterns. There's a rhythm to the book of Genesis. But on the seventh day, the pattern gets interrupted. That'd be a good book title. <laughs> pattern interrupt. Check it out on Amazon. It's good. Pattern interrupt. Okay. Audible, Kindle, pattern interrupt. Darren Stott. Okay. All right, good. On the seventh day, the pattern gets interrupted. Why? Because on the seventh day, it doesn't end with, and there was evening, and there was morning the seventh day. Why? Because he doesn't put a period on it. This is the run-on sentence that, that he intended to go into eternity. He created this realm and said, let it be. Now, the real big question, the question that you, that you guys are wondering about. When you rest, you like to sit down. Okay? Okay. I know that about you. When you rest, you like to sit down. So then, on the seventh day, did God actually sit down? We're going we're gonna to talk about this. The big theological questions that everybody's asking. Did God actually s- sit down? Yeah. When, when, I, when I need rest, I get out my... Now, i got to confess some sin real quick. Um, I just turned 40 years old, okay? I know I don't look a day over 27, but um, yeah, I just turned, I just turned 40. Don't tell anyone. And, um, and God, I'll blame it on God. I don't usually use the God card, but I'll, I will today. Um, God put a desire in my heart, okay, for a recliner. <laughs> it's God's fault. Listen, I've never, I've never wanted a recliner, okay? I've never wanted a recliner. I, I'm telling you, I turned 40. And I was like, I wanted a recliner. I had this image, okay? I, I do my sermon prep at a desk, okay? But I just had this romantic image of me sitting in a recliner with my lamp on, with my laptop on my lap, writing a sermon. I just thought that sounded, that sounded cool. And so, um, I, and, 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 and you can have to talk to Roy about this. I, I, I first told Roy, I think I want a recliner, right? We talk, anyways, the Lord blessed me with a recliner. He sure did. I, I didn't have to pay for it. And so I got myself a, 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 a lazy boy. And um, uh, it's not a lazy boy. It's, it's something. That's a brand, isn't it? But anyways, here's the thing. Um, my family, they made fun of me. They called it the old man chair. They're like, Dad got an old man chair. Ha, 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 ha. But can I tell you something? Like, I don't even get to sit in the old man chair. My family is always in my old man chair. Like, isn't it true? And sometimes, like, literally my entire family is sitting in that one chair. Like, like there's like 80, 100 people in that chair. And I'm just like, whatever, I'll just sit on this hard fut- futon thing. Um, anyways, okay, so here's the question. On the seventh day, did God actually sit down? okay. So on the seventh day, we see Shabbat, okay? Celebration and enjoyment, this place of rest. The word actually means to return back to the seat. The word Shabbat means to return back to the seat and to not just sit down, but to settle in. Okay, I want, you guys, I want you all to sit down. Good. Now I want for you to settle in. There's a difference between sitting, yes, teacher, and settling in. Is it a lazy boy? Is it a recliner, a recliner that God sits in? Here's what's interesting. That we always equate rest to a ceasing of all activity. Okay? But when you read the word of God and you read where he rests, we're going to quickly see that his chair is not a lazy boy. It's a throne. Why? Because kings have thrones. What else do kings have? Footstools. So if the king has a throne, and if he has a footstool, then 
what are we talking about here? We're talking about Isaiah 66, verse 1. Where does God sit down on the seventh day? Check it out. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne. And what is my footstool? The earth. The heavens, the cosmos, okay, is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me and the place where I rest? Two different kinds of rest, okay, biblically and historically. When you look at the kind of rest that God's people sit and settle in, that biblically Sabbath rest looks like a land that is free from God's enemies. So for the believer, for us to sit down and to settle in, what does this look like? It looks like a believer, a son and daughter, who is free from all demonic interference. This is what Paul would say. Put on your helmet of salvation. Why? Your helmet of salvation to protect your hearts is the very armor that will keep you in Shabbat, in Sabbath rest. So if Sabbath rest for a believer is living in a land that is free of God's enemies, which is absolutely true biblically and historically, what does Shabbat look like for God? That for God, the setting is usually found from him not just ceasing from work, but in the context of sitting on a throne with his feet on a footstool in a place where he can find rest. Now, in early Babylonianism and within paganism, um, even if you travel to r remote places throughout Asia and, and, and into villages where they practice animism, and you begin to see these various shrines and temples that they make for their gods, what's the purpose of a temple? The purpose of a temple is to create a place where the deity can find rest. That's why within pagan temples, you will always find seats, chairs. You will find oftentimes a throne for their god. That within world religions, a temple is where the gods find rest and refreshing. Now Isaiah says, the cosmos is the temple of God. Now, don't think of cosmos the way that Discovery Channel defines cosmos, which is just the universe. It's just the stars. No, biblically, the cosmos is everything that God has created. So when you look outside and you see the trees and you see the birds, you are seeing the cosmos. You are seeing the created order of things. So we have the first six days of creation, the first day God creates time. What's he doing? He's creating a temple. He's creating a place where he is going to sit down on his throne, and he's going to rule within a place and posture of rest. Like a, day one, time. Time for what? Time unto himself. Day two, he creates space. Okay, uh, day three, he's creating all of creation. He's putting order to it. Cosmos means order. Where does it begin? In the disorder. What does God do each day? He brings order out of disorder. What do you do each day? You bring order out of disorder. And what is God doing? He is creating What's he creating? He's creating a temple. And what does he do on the seventh day? He enters into his temple and he sits down and he settles in and he enjoys the temple that he just created. Now, 
Next week, we're going to look at Eden. It's the second epoch of Genesis. When we start getting into Eden, you're going to see all the links and parallels between Eden and the temple. For example, what does God put within the rakia? He creates the heavenly bodies that are referred to as lights. Did you know that the same Hebrew word used for those lights, for those stars, that that's the same Hebrew word used in the Pentateuch to describe the lampstand in the tabernacle? The same Hebrew word used for stars is the word that is used for the lampstands in the tabernacle. The second thing, what's in Eden? We're going to get into this next week. Rivers. There are four rivers, right, that stem from the one river. And we're going to see here, um, uh, uh, you'll see the link. If you look at Ezekiel 47, verse 1, and Ezekiel's temple, what are you going to see? You're going to see the temple, and you're going to see the river of God. The third element, this is fascinating. So God creates mankind. He creates what? Sons and daughters. What does he create them for? He creates them for the temple. Genesis 2.15, he's going to give them their job description. Uh, in fact, we're going to have a whole week called The Watchmen. Why? Because that is the job title that he gives to Adam and Eve. He makes them watchmen in Eden. It's fascinating. We have a whole week just on that. But the word choice, again, used for the job description for Adam and Eve Guess what he uses? He uses all priestly terms. See, a lot of us think that God created the Garden of Eden, right? Nope. What did he create? He created Eden, and in Eden he put a garden. What was God doing? He was creating a home. Eden would be the convergence point between heaven and earth. And the garden would not be where God frequented and visited. The garden would be where God sat. What happened? Genesis 3 happens. The fall happens. Sin happened. Rebellion happened. And guess what happened? The great disconnection. The great fracturing. A veil that would separate heaven from earth. We see here that God's people radically fell out of rest. And what did God have to do? He had to institute rest as a commandment, but he didn't do it out of anger and rage. And he did it out of deep compassion, that out of covenant, that he would give his people an impartation and a revelation of who he is. This is what he would tell his people. He would tell his people, if you don't have a revelation of rest, you don't have a revelation of who I am. Why? Because I am the God that sits down. I am the God that rules from a throne. Church, we have got to learn how to rule from a throne. We have got to learn how to rule as kings and not just rule or try to rule as servants. If we could just work harder, ah, work harder, ah, you're not working hard enough, ah, that's the problem with America, ah, you don't work, ah, 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 ah. David would say, he makes me lay down in green pastures. Why? Because when you learn to lay down, you're not just being godly, you're being God-like. It's the duty of kings to lay down. It's the duty of kings to rule from a posture of rest and sitting. Exodus 31, uh, verse 13. You'll remember, this is when um, uh, Moses is having the, the profound encounter with the Lord and, and God is speaking and he's going to give them the Ten Commandments. But what is that? He's going to give them ten rhythms by which they will get a glimpse into who he is and a glimpse into what Eden was originally like. This is him saying, you can't come into Eden, but you can get a taste of what it was like. You can't come into Eden. Why? Because of the veil 
but you can get a taste of what it will one day be like once the Redeemer comes. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come. So you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Uh, observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it uh, is to be put to death. So this is what God says. On the seventh day, and now this is a 24-hour period, his origin, origin, when we forget our origin, will abdicate our destiny. We will abdicate our authority. We won't see the scroll by which we are to govern. So as we return back to God's word and we see his original blueprint for humanity is that this would be an ongoing lifestyle of ruling rest. What did it become? It became a 24-hour period of time where you rested or you were put to death. What's the point of that? Well, the wages of sin is death. You know, a lot of people think that good people go to heaven, but that's not true. The truth is that forgiven people go to heaven. And we're all in need of forgiveness. I've had so many conversations with people of every religion that you can think of. And when I talk about the gospel, when I talk about what we subscribe to out of the Bible, you know what, They'll, people will disagree with me on, on all kinds of theological points, but can I tell you one thing that nobody ever disagrees with me on? When I tell people, hey, we've all sinned, we've all screwed up, we've all made big mistakes. I have never once had somebody correct me and tell me that I was wrong. No matter what religion you find yourself a part of, we all agree that what we have on this earth is a sin problem. And no matter how hard humanity tries to clean up our own messes, we just make more messes. This is why it's so, so, so important that we know this and we teach this and we believe this and we re represent this, that humanity makes for a lousy God. That humanity makes for a lousy savior. That you don't need a self-help religion. You don't need a self-help philosophy. You don't need just to be a positive thinker. No, you need a savior. You need a shepherd. You need a friend. Yeah. We are all in need of forgiveness. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe would not perish, but would have life. Jesus did not come that you would have a Christian worldview. Jesus did not come that you would have a Christian belief structure. Jesus came that you would have life and life abundantly. What are you talking about, Darren? Jesus came. Yep, it's true. You see, generations waited, and we get to read all about this in the Old Testament. They waited, they waited, they waited. They kept hearing from the prophets. And what would the prophets say? Imagine going to church every single week and always hearing the same sermon. He's coming. Imagine sitting by your mommy and saying, Mommy, that's what he said last week. Imagine that you grow up and, and, and your grandchildren are sitting in church. When's he coming? It's the same sermon. Week after week, year after year, all the preacher ever wants to say is, Redeemer is coming. Yahweh God, make himself flesh. He's going to come and dwell among us. Every single week, when's he coming? When's he, he still hasn't come yet. He still hasn't come yet. He still hasn't come yet. You get to the middle of your Bible, and there's a radical transition. The transition is there's a heralding and a proclamation that God has made himself flesh, that he's been laid in a manger. There is this incredible um, uh, thing that takes place, and the King Herod wants to kill him. We get to see this whole thing. Jesus grows up. He lives. He dies. Okay? He resurrects from the dead. And then what does he tell his disciples? Go into all the world and bring forth this good news of the gospel. The good news is this, that every person can have peace and great joy. Why? Eden is now open for business. What happened when Jesus died? Well, a symbolic veil of separation that was in the temple that separated screw-ups, that separated jacked-up people from the Holy of Holies, that that thick veil that kept the dirtiest of the dirty out, and the only, the only people that could go in there were the, were the priest, the priesthood. When Jesus came as the sinless lamb, 
And when he was crucified on the cross at that very moment, that veil that separated humanity from God was torn, symbolic of the heavenly veil, symbolic of the, of, of the blockade between, between Eden and, and, and humanity. That veil was also torn in two. Skip a beat. The apostles, the people of God, there's 120. The church is 120 people. What are they doing? They're waiting. Jesus is ascended. He's gone into heaven. He said, wait. Why? I'm sending God the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this, it's better that I leave. Because if I stay, I can only be in one place at one time. It's better that I leave. Why? Because I am transitioning my ministry onto you. And you are going to go as my image bearers into this great Edenic restoration mandate. You're going to enter right back into where we left off in the book of Genesis. I'm going to establish you as redeemed, restored watchmen. I'm going to establish you to pastor the earth. I'm going to establish you to pastor nations. What are they doing? They're waiting. It's like a theme in the Bible. How many of you have ever noticed the theme of waiting? Waiting. You've waited this long. You've waited this long. When, God? When? They waited for Jesus to come. He finally came. He did what he wasn't supposed to do. He died. It looked like total defeat. And then he came back to life. And then he left them, only to leave them waiting again. It says in Acts chapter 2 that a sound came from heaven like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And that the same fire of God that came upon Moses on Mount Sinai came down into the room and it split up 120 times. God the Holy Spirit came in above each and every one of them and what did he do? He sat down. He sat down into his temple, into 120 temples. And he did not just sit, he settled in. In Acts chapter 2, for thousands of years, our God celebrated the seventh day and he Shabbat inside his people. He sat down, he settled in, not to visit with them, but to abide, to rest, to rule from a place of rest. You know that Paul said, that we've been crucified with Christ. We've been resurrected with Christ. And we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Where, where does Jesus sit? Where does the king sit? In a throne. And he doesn't just sit, he settles in. You are invited to abide with him in the place where he abides. Not in a 24 hour period of time called Sabbath. We are invited to live a life of Sabbath rest where we get to rule from a place of peace, celebration, thanksgiving, great joy that we're not driven with the same frequency that drives this world. Our wisdom is not a created wisdom. It's not a cosmic wisdom. It's not a worldly wisdom. We are seated with Jesus in his throne in heavenly places. And in him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being, our understanding of who we are. It's in this place where Paul had the epiphany. I have the mind of Christ. It's in this place where Paul had the revelation of when I'm here, 
I begin to grow the fruit of the Holy Spirit. When I, when I recognize that I am seated in him and with him in this throne, that without even trying, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, it's not even mine, it's His. And then I get access to everything that He is. And now I don't have to give myself an identity based off of my lack. When things in my life change, that doesn't dictate my level of importance. When people put me down or they misunderstand me, it hurts. But it doesn't change my reality. The enemy will do everything that he can to accuse you, to nag you, to condemn you, to get you to do what? To get you to leave the seat of rest. You say, ah, now I get it. This whole thing has been a rest test. Because if, if, I, if I can pass this test of rest, I can step into a life that the world says, wow, that dude's blessed. He doesn't even try. Look at that confidence. Look at that authority. That must be self-confidence. No. No, that's Christ's confidence. Wow, you don't even have to try to prove who you are. Wow, you don't even, you don't even talk about yourself. You just talk about others. Wow. You could have people wash your feet, but instead you wash other people's feet. Wow, you could use your power. You could use your power for your own fame. Instead, it, instead you defer your power for the good of others. What are you a part of? What are you, what are you doing? I've never seen, I've never seen somebody with that kind of money, with that kind of power, with that kind of family, and they use the blessing to be good pastors in the earth, to expand Eden. Maybe your heart's felt like a wilderness. Maybe it's been lonely. Maybe you've never been understood. Maybe you've had difficulty and crisis with your own dad, with your own mom, with your own siblings. Maybe life's been a struggle. But this morning, there can be understanding, your own moment of epiphany, where you realize, wow, all of this for such a time as this, because there's been a battle over Eden to keep me from entering into the rest of God, to keep me from sitting down. Listen, if you're here today, the Lord wants to come and open Eden within your heart. Why? He wants to make his home inside of you. Let's stand. Can we all just close our eyes just to create a privacy? How many of you, you feel, you feel the peace of God in this room? Just, just wave at me. It's like, listen, that's not just a feeling. That's Jesus. He's here today. He loves you so much. And in a moment, we're going to have to leave here. But that peace doesn't have to leave. 
that joy doesn't have to leave. That, that sense of being loved by God doesn't have to leave. You can leave here today and you can take not just an emotion of peace, but you can take the Prince of Peace with you. If you're here today and you'd say, hey, Pastor Darren, sin, sickness, death, these frequencies, they've had a hold on me, but today I want to surrender and give my life to Jesus. I want him to come and sit down on me. I want him to come and make his home in me. Listen, if this is connecting, if this is making even like 25% sense, and you're like, man, dude, I want to respond. I want Jesus to make his home in me. Would you just lift up your hand and wave it like a fool for like five seconds so I can see it? Just wave at me and just be like, hey, this is connecting. I, I want this. God bless you. God bless you. All hands all through this room. God bless you. Hands all through this room. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. I'm not even going to count them. Let's do this. Let's all pray together. Is that good? Close your eyes. We're going to talk not to me. We're going to talk to Jesus, okay? I want you to use your imagination. I want you to see him as if he's standing right in front of you. I want you to see him with a smile on his face because he's so proud of you. You are the very reason why he came. You are the very reason that he died. You are the very reason that we are a church. You are the reason why we gathered here today at 11 o'clock. Let's pray. You can just repeat after me. Jesus, I've tried to be my own shepherd. It's been confusing. It's been lonely and at times heartbreaking. I need you to be my shepherd. I invite you to come into my heart and I ask that you would break the power of sin, sickness, disease, and death. Jesus, in your word it says, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. So now I open my heart, I open my spirit, I open my mind to the way, the truth, and the life. Now just hold out your hands in, in front of you like a receiving posture as if I'm like I'm gonna give you a gift, okay? And just by faith, you might not feel anything, but you might feel something amazing. It doesn't matter about feelings, it's about faith. person in this room. We welcome the person of the Holy Spirit. Not to visit, but to abide. Pray with me. Say, Jesus, you have permission to make your all. Yeah, that's it. That's it. The Ruach. The breath of God. Some of you, you'll feel a, a language bubbling up, and that's, that's okay. It's, that's, it's a new language of the Spirit. We call it tongues, and some of you won't, but that's okay. It'll come. But let it bubble up right now. Filled right now. Filled afresh right now with the Spirit. Filled right now, filled all through this room. The sound of a wind blowing through this room. <sighs> the breath of God, the presence of God, the presence of God right now. Let it bubble up. Fill, fill <sighs> right now. Fill free right now. <sighs> all through this room, all through this room, all through this room, all through this room, all through this room. <sighs> That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Just receive it by faith, by faith, by faith. 
That's Jesus. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, or maybe you rededicated your life, you are now a part of the family of God. You're no longer an outsider looking in. You have a seat at the banqueting table, and this banner will forever be a banner of love flying high and over you. You are part of a family made possible by a covenant that you had nothing to do with. This is a blood covenant instituted and initiated by Jesus as our high priest. And for that, let's give thanks. Hey, listen, and when you screw up, and when you stand up from your seat, don't run away from him. Run to him and sit back down. David would say, he makes me sit down. He makes me lie down. When you screw up, when you stand up, don't run away from God. Run to him. Why? Because you're not saved because of you. You're saved because of him. There will always be a seat for you at the banqueting table, and his banner will always be a banner of love. Hey, if we can pray for you this morning, we'd love to. Um, We're going to open up the front of the church here, and we're going to have some uh, some really amazing moms and dads come up here, and they'd love to just pray for you. If you gave your life to Jesus today, you just want to tell us about it, we'd love to bless you as well. So come on up to the front. Know this, you are absolutely loved. If you've had fun, if you want more, we will be back tonight at 6 p.m. We have a 6 p.m. series that we're doing called The Interrupters. Right now we're studying the 12 apostles, and tonight we'll be studying the Apostle John, John the Beloved. So that'll be at 6. Otherwise, have the most amazing week with Jesus, okay? Love you guys. Bless you.